sacrifices. We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, in Genesis chapter 8, here's what happens. God destroys the world except for this man. And Noah builds a boat, and he and his family, along with the animals, all get in the boat. Some people want to question whether or not this was possible, whether it was, not, it was real. Uh, you know, I'm not going to argue. I believe it is. I simply believe that, that uh, God, this was God's intent. And, and if, you look at, if you look at other civilizations and myths that they have, almost all civilizations have a myth or a story about a mass destruction. I, I just take what the Bible has to say. All right? And here's what it says. Then Noah built an altar. This is after the flood is over. The boat has settled to the ground. And uh, the ground has become dry. He sent out a bird to see whether it's uh, um, okay for a human to go out. The bird doesn't come back. And so Noah takes as it a sign from God that he now can open the ark. He opens the ark. Uh, actually, he had to o God had to open the ark because God shut it from the outside. He wasn't going to open it until God <laughs> opened it. So he comes out, and here's what Noah does. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the invention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Notice verse 22. While the earth remains, Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Did the sun come up this morning? And you're sure it'll come up tomorrow morning? Why? Because the Bible says so. <laughs> okay? Uh, not a real scientific answer, but God says he's not going to change it. There's going to be seed time and harvest. God says he's not going to change it. He can, but he's not. And notice that. He does it, this is what's really cool, that he does it in response to a pleasing aroma from a sacrifice that Noah gave. What about that sacrifice? That sac you, you have to understand that every living beast on the entire earth was in that boat. And now God asks Noah to give a sacrifice from that. And so of all the, and, uh, the clean animals, now we're told that he took two by two, but the clean animals he took more. And of that, God had prepared a way for him to make a sacrifice, which was a, a, a sweet aroma. And God said, I'll never do this again. I'll never do it again. So God ordained these cycles or rhythm in nature. Now, when we come then, to the book of Leviticus, we also see some rhythm in worship. And you'll notice that seven days ago, we met here. Is that right? And seven days from now, we are, by the grace of God, and should things stay the same, going to meet here again. Right? Uh, there's a bit of a rhythm. Some of us might think that this is too much of a ritual. Ah, Sunday's here again. Hey, you know what? Talk about ritual. Talk about boring ritual. You get up and go to work every day. I mean, you know, and uh, at least you get a bit of a break here. You can come here and sing, huh? So, this when when we talk about this matter of worship, we we need to understand that in the book of Leviticus, many rituals are recognized are recognized simply the rhythm of nature and the body. Again, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in these right now, simply because we will get there. But I want you to notice particularly the importance of the number seven. The importance of the number seven. It's interesting because in seven days, God moved from chaos to order. But we also see the same kind of, of seven-day pattern repeated. Because later on, when God is creating a a holy space. The children of Israel have gone down into Egypt and now they've come back out. They've been 400 years without any kind of pattern or they haven't been under their own leadership at all. Now they've come out of Egypt. And so God says, I need to create a holy space whereby we can meet together. 
And check it out. This creation continues because in creating the tabernacle, God spoke seven speeches to Moses on how to create the tabernacle. These seven speeches, if you want to look them up, uh, you'll have to write pretty quickly. Uh, Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. Exodus chapter 30, verse 11, 17, 22, 34. Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 and 12. You don't need to get it all now. We'll, get it, we'll talk about it later. But the plan of the tabernacle was revealed by God to Moses in this ongoing process of creation, seven-day pattern. Now then, when Moses comes to erect the tabernacle, it's not a haphazard thing. There's a plan. There's a scheme to it. There's, there's a method to it. There's a process to it. Because when Moses erects the tabernacle, he does it in, you guessed it, seven acts. Those, each of those acts of building and constructing the tabernacle, you look for the phrase, just as Yahweh commanded him. In Exodus chapter 40, verses 17 through 23, this process of creation, we see the number seven. You say, well, big deal, okay. So maybe it's just by chance. Huh? Okay, hang on. Leviticus then gives instructions how to meet with God. Those instructions on how to meet with God are in the first seven chapters of Leviticus. Through the repeated use of seven speeches, seven acts, the ongoing process of creation, is seen then to extend from the founding of the earth, the founding of the cosmos, to the founding of the tabernacle of God where we can meet with God. So, I don't think that it's any kind of um, uh, happenstance that we happen to meet every seven days. It has again to do with it looking back to creation. Then, then in, the, in the book of Leviticus, I just want to mention very quickly that there are these seven-day rituals. These seven-day rituals mark these uh, ritual uh, passage, as it were, because uh, in, in the, we're going to see in the book of Levit Leviticus that a person becomes unclean. You can become unclean by touching a dead carcass, whatever that dead carcass might be. And in order to be made clean again, there's a seven-day ritual that you have to go through. The same thing it says uh, about uh, uh, other... Um, physical happenings with regard to cleansing. We'll talk about that when we get to the matter of, of rituals. In other words, to move from the unclean to the clean, to move from chaos to order, to move then from as a rite of passage, we see a, constantly these seven-day rituals. Now, when it comes to the year, the year then is, is divided up into some sacred rhythm. The observance of holy days. Yes, you guessed it. Seven holy days of, of um, celebration scattered throughout the year, in addition then to different feasts that were celebrated by the Jewish people. Now, <clears throat> we'll see in Leviticus that every seven years, every seventh year is a sabbatical year. Um... Professors, any professor here, you've taken your sabbatical? Anybody knows what a sabbatical is if you're a professor? Or don't they do that anymore? <laughs> Rats, they're leaving the Bible terribly. The reason for the sabbatical year for a professor, and actually, uh, church, many pastors are given sabbatical years too. Uh, it's biblical. After seven years, or on the seven, after six years, the seventh year, then they're given a year off, basically to read, to study, to become uh, recharged, as it were. We're supposed to do that every week on the seventh day. Then on the seventh year, there's a seventh year sabbatical. And then for the Jews, there was called the year of Jubilee, which was the first year after seven cycles of the Sabbath year. And in the year of Jubilee, all the property goes back to its original owner. And, and really, honestly, folks, when, when you study the year of Jubilee, that is God just simply saying, okay, we're going back now to the beginning, and we're going to start afresh. Everybody gets a clean piece of paper. Everybody goes back to their property. Everybody goes back to their homestead. It all starts over every 50 years. So um, these things 
these priestly uh, traditions having to do with seven, they indicate a sense of movement, a sense of passage. And it emphasizes ritual processes. So what I want to look at now then is the role of these rituals along with the rhythm. Now you say, well, uh, Pastor, what's, what's the deal here? Well, let me tell you what the deal is. Because I'm looking at very busy people, and I would probably, I feel fairly safe in saying that you probably are not very careful about taking a Sabbath rest every week. What's the matter? You're not going to nod your head, you're right, huh? Let me just remind you about something. We're all sinners here. We're all broken. We all need to be redeemed. Let me put it the other way. How many of you are very careful to take a Sabbath rest every week? Okay, good. Good, good. That's very important to do. And actually, uh, I should probably have you stand up because the thing is, I, I want to encourage everybody here. That's not just a bunch of Old Testament religious claptrap. This happened, this starts all the way from the creation. There's this rhythm. And we need this. We need a seven day. Now, um, I work on Sundays. So, I usually try and take Mondays off. Or actually from Sunday afternoon to Monday afternoon. But anyway, uh, I just think that it's, it's important for us. Our bodies are designed that way. We're going against the design, against the grain, when we don't inculcate or add or, or, or make a part of our life this seven-day rhythm. Now, the other thing is then, when it comes to um, um, taking vacations, how many of you really take a vacation? Okay. Okay. All right. Now, if I ask you what you do on that vacation, how many of you come back after your vacation rested or you're waiting, can I get back to work so I can catch my breath? One of the reasons is because what happens in our vacation, the rhythm is just blown out the window. And I, I'm, I'm a, I, all my life I've been a, um, I shouldn't say all my life, um, I, I was a distance runner, okay, until until I can no longer run. But, um, so, in, in running distance, one of the most important things, and if, you, if you're a runner, you understand, you, you call it getting in the zone. You kind of get into a rhythm, and you're just, you're just there, you're just running, and, and the breathing, the heartbeat, the, the, the cadence, it all comes into line. And you know, you feel like you can just run and run and run. Because there's a, and life can be that way too. When you get into a rhythm of life, you, can, you, you just feel like you're on a roll, as it were. And you feel like you can go. And, but it's, when, it's when we get this confusion and this chaos and when the rhythm is broken and disturbed, then we, it, it's very difficult. And how many of you, honestly, when you came back to Taiwan this summer, it took you a while to kind of get back into things. Don't we always say that? We're still trying to get back into things. I came back and, and was at, at uh, I think, I don't know if I preached the first Sunday. I don't like to preach the first Sunday getting back because I'm just not into it. I'm not. It's, and it takes a while to, to kind of get back into the rhythm. I, you see, folks, uh, that it's, it's something that is a part of us that we really should be looking for in our life. It's not just a physical thing. It's also a spiritual thing where we need to have these uh, spiritual rhythm. And, and uh, with that, to help us, God gives us certain rituals certain rituals. A ritual is a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Now, uh, I come from an independent Baptist background. And the emphasis on the independent. We don't do anything with anybody and we do everything we want to do the way we think it ought to be done. Consequently, we have no friends, we have no fellowship. And, and, and so forth. I mean, check it out. Independent Baptists. You'll find independent Baptists everywhere. And they don't, they don't fellowship with anybody. And so um, I'm, I'm glad to say that that's where I came from. That in seeing that, that that's, God wants us then to, to be able to learn to have these, how should I say, uh, religious practices. And um, one of the things that we Baptists, you know, we, we have almost no ritual in our services at all. Have you noticed that? And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing myself because I know where I'm from. But 
I would say many Christians